everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for episode three of season six of the Revise and Resubmit podcast. I'm Dr. Kim Bissell, the Southern Progress Endowed Professor in Magazine Journalism and the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Communication and Information Sciences at the University of Alabama. And I'm Dr. Annalisa Bowen, an Assistant Professor in the Department of Communication Studies, also at the University of Alabama. And we both work in the Institute for Communication and Information Research, or the ICIR, at UA. Okay, so Kim, I feel like we have already talked about many different areas of communication research this season. We have had discussions with guests about politics and health and sports and science and public relations and journalistic practice, you name it. But we haven't had too much time to talk to our guests about music, which makes today's conversation an even more fun one. And yes, this is still related to research. Absolutely. That is right. Before we tell you a little more about what to expect in today's episode, we got to get that question in. (laughs) So here we go, Annalisa. When you think about those younger years when you were growing up and we were all finding our way with music and artists, did you have favorites or did you have specific artists that you were not allowed to listen to? Uh, okay, so great question. Um, I have d- definitely so specific artists that I was not allowed to listen to. So once my mom found my Coolio CD <laughs> and um, <laughs> she t- took it right away um, and I never found it. Um, and then I distinctly remember I was always trying to buy CDs that had the parental advisory label mm-hmm. on them and being denied. So in a Tower Records in Seattle once, I wanted the score by Fuji's and it had a parental advisory sticker on it. Um, And I removed that sticker and I, I, (laughs) this is so (laughs) stupid. I was like, oh my gosh, I found one that doesn't have a parental advisory notification. Can I have it? And I did. And it, (laughs) right. I mean, I'm sure my parents were not that dumb but may, may, maybe they were <laughs> and it remains one of my favorite albums so haha there um I went through a country phase in about 1992 but like from high school to today I have listened to my local rap hip-hop station unapologetically yes and then when I started teaching Zumba and which has continued and Spotify agrees it seems I found that I enjoyed Latin trap music a lot. Love Um, it. Love it. (laughs) And finally, like, goodness, I could talk about this, I guess, a lot. Um, I'll listen to a musical almost any day. Mm -hmm. And I've enjoyed Taylor's last album more than I thought I would. And what about you, Kim? Um, Such a fun, maybe it's not a fun question, because it (laughs) gets down to me saying I was a very sheltered child that was truly Mm -hmm. only exposed to Christian music or classical music growing up. I think I had a bit of a rebellion at one point, or maybe we can just say I went rogue, and I (laughs) secretly, or so I thought, joined this record club. Yep, that's what we now call the vinyl, Um, (laughs) because it offered six free records, and then you only had to purchase one a month. Now, my sweet 14-year-old self had no income, Mm -hmm. no one to pay for these additional records each month. month. (laughs) <laughs> yeah big whoops I don't know what I was thinking and I also did not think through that the records would be coming to the mail to the house <laughs> so how am I not getting busted <laughs> but with those six free ones I bought records from artists I had heard about but didn't know anything about Kenny mm. Rogers no mm. I don't know what was going on Earth Wind and Fire Air Supply Journey mm. I even got a Madonna record thrown in nice um, I'll save the trouble I got into for another episode <laughs> But the point is, I did play them over and over, Mm. rather quietly. And I think for the first time, I got to see storytelling from this perspective. Mm, Nice, nice. Yeah, I mean, I like a good Madonna Madonna song. But it doesn't be Coolio. No, well, you know, I I tell you, that's my finer days there. (laughs) (laughs) So in today's episode, we catch up with Dr. Alex Vizi an assistant professor in the Department of Journalism and Creative Media, who's going to tell us more about some of the challenges in the music industry, including mental health crises facing many artists, as well as uh, the way that beauty is commodified and has been for decades. So please stick around for this episode. We will talk about a lot. And without more chatter from us, please join us in welcoming Alex to the show.
Alex, thank you so much for joining us today. We are thrilled to be able to have you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Okay, Alex. So we kick off off our podcast with a couple easy no think questions. Um, just to give our listeners a little bit of a sense of who you are. So first question is, where are you from? So originally I'm from Alvin, Texas, which is like a rural suburb between Houston and Galveston. So Southeast Texas. Um, and I did my undergrad and my master's degree at UT Austin, a very common thing that a lot of kids from the suburbs of Texas do. Um, and when I was an undergrad in journalism, I actually did my undergrad in journalism and history. I discovered that I really loved media studies um, uh, as part of my like uh, communication requirement as an undergrad. So I took a couple of RTF classes and uh, in particular, um, wanted to work with Mary Kearney, who was a professor at the time in RTF. And so I did my master's degree at Texas. Um, so undergrad, like 2001 to 2005, um, master's 2006 to 2008. Um, and in the RTF department, I really realized how much I was interested in women's labor in the music industries. Mm. And um, I took a few years off in between my master's and PhD. Uh, was a blogger, um, did freelance work, particularly for Bitch Media, ran a blog called Feminist Music Geek uh, for a couple of years, um, in part because I didn't get in the first time I tried to apply for PhD programs. It was a weird time. It was the recession. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I kind of was like, well, let me take this opportunity. I was working at the LBJ Library uh, at the time um, out of my master's degree, and I was like, I have access to the UT Music Library let me kind of take this, you know, hiatus to kind of get a sense of, of what I actually for real, for real want to do. Because <laughs> um, often you just kind of go through your master's because you're not sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was really sort of committed by that point. I also was able to kind of save up um, some, some money um, for those kind of fallow periods during the summer in your PhD program. Mm -hmm. um, I took a few years off and ultimately decided uh, to go back in uh, and I got my PhD uh, in media studies through the Com Arts Department at UW Madison. Um, started in 2011, got my PhD in 2016. Um, so that, kind of broadly speaking, is my trajectory. Okay. And what is it that you? What What do you do now? I mean, not like on a like <laughs> hourly basis, but what, what's your job? I identify uh, primarily as a feminist music industries scholar. So I'm really interested in bridging. Uh, the robust tradition within media studies around feminist practice, um, particularly around delegitimated mass popular culture, uh, with a real eye and perspective toward labor and, and workplace practices, uh, and bringing that to bear on industry studies, which has uh, its own robust history within media studies about um, sort of how media industries operate, how projects come to be, how they get greenlit, how uh, properties circulate. Um, through sort of industrial frameworks. And so I really try to sort of bridge those two disciplines with uh, particular attention toward how female identified musicians do their work. Uh, and specifically, I would say um, my, you know, my kind of identity as a scholar to this point has been particularly interested in how female identified musicians in like the contemporary moment kind of toggle between industries in order to make a living. So not just paying attention to like their recording practices, but specifically, and this, this gets into like my, my current book project, um, brand partnerships, how they sort of work with uh, fragrance companies and fashion labels and equipment manufacturers to sort of extend their professional and, and creative lives. Um, because it's, uh, you know, one thing that music industry scholars are really cognizant of right now is that the recording is, is as devalued as it has ever been in the streaming era. Um, you get like a, a penny to a tenth of a penny per stream. So musicians really are having to sort of be uh, savvy about how to create other sources of income for themselves and also ways to keep themselves creatively motivated. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in how women are navigating that really complicated space in the music industry. Okay, I'm not gonna lie. I am so excited to hear more about all of this. And we might have to schedule three <laughs> four more additional episodes sure. to hear about it all. <laughs> um, but before we get into that, tell us what did the young Alex want to be when she was growing up? Well, first I wanted to be a cat. 
And my mom, my mom was like, you can't be another species when you grow up. You have to figure out a profession that you want. Um, uh, and it's interesting, actually, I bring up my mom, um, who um, a choir director, a junior high choir director, and prior to that had this very long career in graphic design, um, textbook publishing, um, really had like this, this interesting pr professional life. And I think it, it motivated me a great deal. But one thing my mom was never really able to do was get her PhD. She always wanted to be a historian, mm -hmm. but by virtue of like the generation she came up in, it was really important for her to, her to get married and all of that. And so, um, she was always really encouraging of me being intellectually curious. She always took me to museums. She always, you know, put books in my hand. She was always interested in what I was listening to. Um, and so, you know, I, it took a little while. I think like when I was in grade school and through high school, I had designs on being like a Broadway actress, um, mm -hmm. musical theater. Um, but when I got to college, I, I, I sunk into the idea pretty quickly that I wanted to be a professional feminist. Um, wow. But how of that like was kind of, you know, it was complex because, um, uh, first I thought I might want to be like a, a lawyer, um, uh, like a sort of reproductive justice lawyer. Uh, then I thought maybe I wanted to go in public policy. I shadowed some law classes. I shadowed, um, uh, you know, classes in, in policy work at, at UT. And it just wasn't exactly my environment. I also thought about library school. And I remember my, um, I, I took a, 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 an undergraduate seminar in media and social justice with Karen Wilkins. And I wrote a paper about Reno 911 and gay representation. Mm -hmm. and she was like, you should do this. Like, you're really good at it. <laughs> um, and I was like, oh, okay. Um, you know, like I hadn't fully thought about, about, being a professor as as that way forward but in a way it was kind of a full circle thing because it was always something my mom wanted for herself and so i think i kind of locked into it um kind of end of college and like i said i did my masters at ut and then and then went on from there i mean i gotta say while it's so fun to hear about what people do now in their research and their scholarship I think the path to how they got to where they are now is always such a fun question mm -hmm. um, because what an amazing answer. This is so, so cool. <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm going to dive in here. Sure. And you, you, what I'm hearing is that there might be some issues um, in the music industry Mm -hmm. um, with, with equity um, mm -hmm. and um, justice um, mm -hmm. can, can you talk about I, I think on the surface we we uh, outsiders might be like well I mean what more do you want you're making millions or or maybe even thousands it sounds good to me um <laughs> So what is what is this about? Be be grateful. Be thankful your songs are being played. But kind of can can you tell us a little bit more about like why this is no this is an issue? Well, I think there's there's kind of layers to that. I would say first off, um, it's always important to keep in mind when you're talking about musicians, like there's so much that you have to pay out to your label. Mm -hmm. um, uh, touring expenses, video expenses, uh, studio time. Uh, and so there's this perception, especially if, if you get big, if, if you become like a, 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 you know, a major pop star that you've got it made. But, um, you know, if we think about like someone like Whitney Houston, for example, um, when she died, um, very tragically of, of a drug overdose after a, a long history with cocaine abuse, um, she was apparently like in, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. And also, you know, her body was ravaged, her voice was not in good shape because she wasn't sort of being protected and cared for. And it's interesting, um, over the break, I was reading this really great piece by Jen Pelly, uh, who's a, a music journalist and a, and a colleague and a friend of mine about the mental health crisis in the music business that's been exacerbated by COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and, and people trying to sort of get back on the road to kind of recoup expenses from from canceled tours and things of that sort. But I think in general, a lot of musicians, you know, they're, they're sort of discovered or come to music when they're very young. They often come to music because, uh, or 
um, they've, they've sort of felt unheard or, or unseen or marginalized in, in various aspects of their life. And so they come to music to express themselves as like a, a safe haven as a source of solace. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's a very easy thing to exploit, particularly if you're young. Women especially are preyed upon for this because of their um, the ways in which their beauty can be commodified, um, mm -hmm. the ways in which they can be uh, subjected to harassment and misconduct from producers, managers, um, uh, booking agents, people that they encounter on the road. Um, in addition to which, women historically have been um, uh, maneuvered out of royalties when it comes to songwriting credit, producer mm -hmm. credit. Mm -hmm. Um, because they may not know particularly if they're starting out when they're very young. Think of someone like Aretha Franklin, um, who's like singing, but also like putting together piano arrangements and arranging like the, the backing vocal arrangements for her songs. But she's not necessarily getting credit for that by, uh, by her label for all of that work. She's just sort of getting credited as the, as the performer, but not getting producer credit, not getting songwriting credit, not getting arranging credit. Um, and so I think all of those components uh, coupled with the idea that music is supposed to be fun, right? There's a way that music is always sort of associated with leisure time. Um, it has kind of associations with like hedonism, life on the road, excess. Um, there's lots of different ways that musicians can get exploited and have been exploited historically over time. And women in particular, young women especially, um, are, are often wrung dry. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I have a question, and I think it's going to be something that's very helpful for our listeners. Sure. How do you study this? <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. So um, I would say foremost, I, I always start with the trades. I, re I read Billboard um, pretty regularly. I've been a subscriber for a number of years, as well as like Rolling Stone, um, uh, um, Pitchfork, uh a variety of, of music trades um, because that's where often where musicians are, you know, um, by virtue of promotional mechanisms alone, sort of where they disclose a lot of the stuff. I will also say, given that I'm studying contemporary phenomena, musicians themselves have been a lot more forthcoming about these things on social media. So I you mm. know, scour Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. Um, memoirs, I'm a big fan of memoirs. And in general, I think a lot of feminist media scholars kind of go to the memoir as a place where female artists in particular, especially when they're kind of um, in the middle or toward the end of their career, although increasingly younger women are writing memoirs too, mm -hmm. um, as a place where, where uh, female artists can kind of disclose things that have happened to them, um, obviously with an eye toward myth-making and image management, but often these are spaces where they can kind of disclose things that are meaningful to them. So for example, in my book, which I'm happy to talk about more, um, <laughs> one of my chapters is about Patti LaBelle. Um, and Patti LaBelle pivoted into cookbook authorship in her middle age um, as she was sort of grappling with um, a, a long love of food that came from her family, but also a history, particularly with the women in her family with diabetes and cancer. And she was like, you know, her mom died and all of her sisters died. And then she was diagnosed with type two diabe diabetes. And she had to sort of figure out how she was going to approach cooking, something that she loved to do, uh, which she talked about in her memoir uh, and then became like a cookbook author and sort of pivoted into that and used the cookbook as a way to kind of reframe some of these stories that she told in her memoir uh, while honoring the, the legacy of, of women in her family mothers, grandmothers, aunties, who um, uh, primarily worked as domestics as well as farmers and had this like sort of uh, robust history uh, making food. Uh, so I love memoirs um, for that. I'd also say um, I've done a bit of participant observation research, particularly at South by Southwest, mm. um, which is always great to go to the, um, the panels and sort of talk with folks after, raise questions during the panels, because there's actually a lot of interest in branding um, and merchandise at South by Southwest. Mm. Um, uh, podcasts are also a space, I think, where, where people are, um, are disclosing a lot of this information as well. Uh, so I try to sort of combine all of those things um, uh, along with um, textual analysis of, of recordings, of videos, of promotional materials, and things of that sort. 
Okay. So I've got two questions here. So one is, so you got this book coming. Mm -hmm. Um, I do. Tell, tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. Uh, So uh, the name of the book is, um, let me make sure I get all of it. Um, After colon is always tricky for me. Um, uh, So the name of my book is Extending Play, The Feminization of Collaborative Music Merchandise in the Early 21st Century. Um, I'll say that it is in production. Um, uh, it is coming out, it's forthcoming um, from Oxford Uni- University Press. Um, I just got the, the go ahead from my publisher that it's in production. I don't yet have a, a release date, but I hope to have that within the next couple of months. Um, but basically the book looks at um, what I'm referring to as collaborative music merchandise, which is a way for me to sort of talk about brand partnerships within a music industry specific context, because while brand partnerships are very common in sports, in um, influencer culture, uh, among celebrities in television and film, uh, I posit in my book that um, brand partnerships have a unique relationship to merchandise in the music industry because of the relationship that musicians have had historically uh, with the merch booth. Uh, Going back, uh, I I, I sort of position it within my book going uh, as far back as fan clubs of teen idols in the post-war period, looking specifically at um, Frank Sinatra and Elvis Presley, um, that merch in the music business actually sort of originated from female fans, um, what we might identify as teeny boppers. Um, (laughs) You have fan clubs in the post-war period. You have the emergence of the merch booth in the er, the mid to late 60s with the rise of rock music and and rock concerts. Uh, And women and girls are integral to the the formation uh, of merch in the music business, as I argue in my book. Um, But I use that as a context in which to locate the contemporary practices around um, brand partnerships with female identified musicians. And I note in the book that all musicians are doing brand partnerships. All musicians have their own branded vodka, Crocs, uh, vape pens, uh, et cetera. But I locate women specifically in, in this phenomena, one, because often merch is delegitimated and feminized uh, as like sort of crass commercialism. Um, often it's, it's sort of a way to um, uh, pit women against men in terms of like masculine, ma- ma- the masculinization of popular music as an art form uh, mm. and the commercialization mm. of, of it is often sort of feminized. Um, but also, men still are, are, are outperforming women in brand partnerships in terms of how much money they make. And if you think about like people like Puff Daddy, Kanye West, Jay-Z, um, they're tremendously financially successful in, based on their forays into branded fashion, um, uh, liquor, et cetera. Um, but a lot of what I argue in the book is that um, a lot of these collaborative music merchandise ventures really rely on feminized knowledge knowledge. Um, uh, and someone like Jay-Z has, has made a very substantial career for himself in part by uh, being a mentor for Rihanna, who mm-hmm. is the mm-hmm. most successful. Do you still? Yes. Yep. yep you okay. Are. okay. Um, you know, somebody like Rihanna uh, is one of the most financially successful recording artists of the 21st century. And she has become successful, financially successful, largely due to her influence as a beauty mogul, particularly Mm -hmm. with her Fenty Beauty um, Mm -hmm. cosmetic line, which is a partnership that she put together um, with Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, the the, um, fashion and lifestyle brand, luxury brand conglomerate. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I look at, I, I look at a variety of sectors. I look at fashion, I look at cosmetics, I look at perfume, I look at, at cooking as, as a form of lifestyle branding. Um, as sort of iterations of feminized knowledge. And I look at how female musicians are really relying upon knowledge that they inherited from their mothers, their sisters, their aunties, uh, as a way to express themselves as artists, particularly kind of at the middle or in the twilight of their recording careers. And then I also look at um, looking at someone like St. Vincent, um, Annie Clark, um, who records under the alias St. Vincent, um, uh, uh, 
pursuing a secondary career as a instrument designer. She has her own mm -hmm. electric guitar and she's really one of the only female artists to have her own signature electric guitar line uh, because the gear manufacturing industry has been historically masculinized since the invention of the electric guitar uh, in the 1930s. Uh, and so, and, and in that instance, she's really sort of queering uh, a masculinized knowledge mm -hmm. and, and creating space for uh, femme, gender non-conforming, non-binary people to pick up a, a, a piece of equipment that has been historically masculinized and therefore off limits to people who don't sort of fit that profile. Um, and, you know, I, I, I have some ambivalence about, uh, about brand partnerships. I, I, I perceive of them very much as like a means to an end. It's a way for artists to continue their, their recording careers, particularly women. Um, but I also want to acknowledge, because I think it's really easy to sort of write this off as crass commercialism, as a form of creative labor. Mm -hmm. These women are making very informed decisions about um, the products that they're making, the, the sort of uh, packaging decisions, the promotional decisions. Uh, and there's a real attention toward like their hands-on work in putting these products together and making them available to the public. Okay, so when you're when you're doing this, this research, mm -hmm. um, I wonder how much of the time you are like, oh, I, this is just this is just terrible, and I can't believe <laughs> that this industry is like this, and this is you know what? How can it be better? Versus like, well, you you get that strategy out there, and you you go hustle and good for you. Like, is there a tension there for you um, personally as you're kind of diving in and, and inundated maybe with all of this information? This is a great question and something that I've sort of had to contend with in various edits, because I think a lot of people I've talked with have kind of a, a negative perception toward this. And to me, I'm really trying to document a phenomena that has, has been in existence, I would say, in earnest since like the turn of the 90s with the rise of the celebrity fragrance, if we think of someone like Elizabeth Taylor and White Diamonds. Mm -hmm. um, that really sort of, because Cher is also part of that moment and that sort of creates the, the beginning of the shift. Mm -hmm. um, I very much perceive that if we are sort of making value judgments of whether this is good or bad, I think we're missing the larger point of the ubiquity of this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, I, I very much perceive it as something musicians have to do now mm -hmm. and something that musicians maybe didn't necessarily feel compelled to do a generation ago. It's very interesting. I came of age in the 90s where you had all these alternative bands that, oh, well, I would never sell my song to a commercial. Or if it did, it was like considered bad form. And now the musicians that we're, we're looking at today, it's like, what a luxury to sell out. What a luxury to be worried about selling out. Most of the musicians that I'm encountering or, or that I'm, I'm studying have had to make these kinds of savvy decisions about their brand, about um, their engagement with social media, about these, these partnerships they're engaging with in order to make a living. So mm -hmm. they don't really get to have this sort of like, oh, maybe, you know, like I can just, you know, make my money back on the road because those, those opportunities are also kind of drying up. Even licensing, which in, in the 90s, you know, you could make up, you know, up to like half a million dollars on a song. I mean, now licensing fees are getting closer to like in between two to 10 years. Um, and so, I mean, I very much try to perceive this as something that we need to study to have a more robust understanding of how devalued the recording and the live concert going experience has become mm. and the sort of, um, inequality that we're seeing in terms of like the the very upper echelon pop star and like the sort of mid-range um you know indie friendly recording artists like i mean i'm trying to sort of make the case rather than be like this is good or bad this is and we need mm -hmm. to sort of understand why this is and then we can sort of in my conclusion i, I um of the book i i you know make the point that we could be making more meaningful changes to like the, you know, um, regulating royalties so that musicians get paid more for streams. Um, we could um, 
be making it more possible for musicians to get out of having to give a percentage of their um, merch revenue to venues or to big companies like Live Nation. Like these to me are like sort of the bigger issues we should be dealing with. And I, I'm trying to sort of look at this phenomenon of collaborative music merchandise as a new normal and trying to sort of capture it and study it um, in this moment. Mm. Okay, so I have a question that goes back to something you had said earlier in our conversation, and you were talking about, you actually mentioned a a bunch of different issues that artists are struggling with, the mental health crisis, Mm -hmm. um, the ways that beauty and appearance can be commodified, Mm -hmm. and then we've been talking about these different partnerships, Mm -hmm. And, and so this is a question that I think our readers are going to, or listeners, readers, <laughs> everyone, um, will be really interested in, but I'm also just fascinated by this, this notion of the way beauty and appearance are commodified. And if you've identified artists who are like, yeah, no, that's not happening. Or do, is it just going to happen anyway because of the label that they're with? Can you kind of help us understand that piece of it and if the artist has any agency in how much we rely on appearance and beauty and maybe sex appeal this is a really this is a really big question and i i mean i will say in answer to part of the question about um uh navigating sex appeal and so forth i do think it's interesting that we are seeing um uh, in the sort of current crop of younger female artists, a, a pushback against like hypersexualization. Somebody mm-hmm. like Billie Eilish comes to mind. Somebody like Olivia Rodrigo comes to mind. Somebody mm-hmm. like Alexa Cara comes to mind. Um, and I do think it's worth noting that when when the ubiquity of collaborative music merchandise um, really begins its ascent is the early two thousands with the sort of the rise of the pop star crossover celebrity, convergent media culture, media mogul model. And somebody like Britney Spears, who I talk about in in my chapter on perfume, um, is very much kind of the exemplar for a new model of pop stardom, where it's not just enough to, you know, be on on the top of the pop charts all the time and have these amazing eye-catching videos, but you also have to have your own sneaker line. You have Mm -hmm. to have your own fragrance collection. Um, and Britney is a really interesting case in this regard, because I think in a lot of ways, Britney has become a cautionary tale. And I'll say in all candor, part of my interest initially in taking this project on was, so she starts making fragrances for Elizabeth Arden in 2003, right? When she's sort of shifting from her um, teen pop princess Mm -hmm. to her like adult sex symbol post Justin Timberlake, Mm -hmm. um, reinvention and at the time you know in the early 2000s it was like it seemed very savvy like Mm -hmm. okay this is this is the way that you help articulate that you're a different version of yourself and and female pop stardom has relied on reinvention at least since Madonna and Janet Jackson in the 80s but you could even make the argument somebody like Diana Ross going solo um, in the early 70s kind of sets the template for this of having to reinvent yourself uh, as a as a female celebrity in order to um, maintain your celebrity. Um, but what became really interesting to me in like 2008, um, when Britney was having a very public mental health crisis and it was, you know, it was the beginning of the conservatorship, um, the way that the trade press would use her fragrance sales as a way to telegraph that she's doing just fine. Mm. He's going to <laughs> mm-hmm. when she clearly wasn't. And it's also interesting, uh, when I was, when I was, um, I've had a long history with this book in part because there's been so many things I've had to had to consider whether or not to update. One thing that I was able to include in the book, um, uh, sort of the the um, conclusion to the chapter on fragrances, is that when Britney appeals her conservatorship um, and it, and is coming forward to to say like or repeal it rather to and and comes forward publicly to talk about the ways that she's been exploited, that she had an IUD implanted in her that she's had to um, uh, perform without her consent, um, you know, that, that there've been all these sort of mechanisms in place to exploit her labor. 
her fragrance sales went through the roof. Mm. Like her wow. response was like, let's buy all her fragrances. But what is also interesting is it seems that Britney has has really had no say in the fragrances, which are now in like, she's got like 30 different fragrances on the market. And during the conservatorship, it, it seems like she's had no control over that, that basically there's been a team of people who have sort of signed off on, who are in charge of her licensing decisions until after the, the conservatorship was repealed. Um, and so that creates this really fascinating set of issues because when Britney was originally, when Britney originally signed the deal with uh, Elizabeth Arden, a big part of why the company was interested in working with her is that she was so hands-on, that she had so many, you know, she was so, um, she had so many ideas in terms of what kind of fragrances she wanted to make, um, how she wanted to appeal to a young female audience specifically, because at the time, most celebrity fragrances were for like middle-aged women. <laughs> um, and, for, and, and were more expensive too. Like they were for department stores. Mm -hmm. um, and the fragrance market at the time wanted to get into like that bath and body works demographic. Like they wanted to appeal to, to young women who shopped at the mall. Um, <laughs> Uh, and there's also a, an earlier iteration of that with like Debbie Gibson in the late 80s. Like she actually kind of sets the template for that with her electric youth fragrance for Revlon. Um, but so there's all this really fascinating, this fascinating negotiation between like agency and exploitation. Mm -hmm. And it starts as something that she really, but then by virtue of how her, her recording career and her personal life become organized after the conservatorship, she actually has very little control over it by the end, but it also mm. becomes a way for fans to sort of stand with her by buying her fragrances. So it's really, it's really rich and complicated. I, I was about, like, I, I, I don't, I don't want my house to be nothing but um, Bravo Liberty products. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, I kind, I kind of do, and I, I, I think about this also because I mean I haven't, I haven't bought perfume in a long time, but mm -hmm. you do see like the names and it, me in my old age, I'm like mm, maybe I don't want Taylor Swift perfume, but maybe I do. <laughs> maybe you want the cardigan, right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. that cardigan was sold out immediately. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, Alex, we are getting to the wrap up section of this episode, but um, we want to make sure that we end with some recommendations for you. So I'm going to put you on the spot with one question we don't typically ask, but that is what are you listening to right now? I love this question. So I will say as part of my personal practice, I listen to an album a day. I listen to albums wow. in the morning when I'm working out. This was a yoga day. Um, so I listened to, I finally got around to listening to SZA's new album, SOS, mm -hmm. um, cause I wanted to give myself like kind of space. So it's a long album and it's, it, you know, deals a lot with like sort of heartbreak. Um, mm -hmm. it's very contemplative. So I listened to that this morning. I really liked it. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, at the end of the year, I actually like kind of went back and listened to all of Anita Baker and Sade and Bjork's albums. Bjork, wow. is, my favorite, Bjork is my favorite living musician. Um, but also, um, uh, for Anita Baker, I'm actually going to see Anita Baker in, um, uh, New Orleans, uh, with Kristen Warner. Um, and I, I've never seen Anita Baker in concert. I love her voice, but Kristen told me that like, that is the, the black women who see Anita Baker are an excellent voice and like can harmonize and sing every note with Anita. So I wanted to be ready. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, I've been, I've been, I guess I've been listening to a lot of introspective women at the moment. I like it. Okay. So what book is on your nightstand or if you just have a book that you've read in the last year that you absolutely loved, can you tell us about that? Sure. Um, well, I will say um, I'm, I'm a, I'm the book reviews editor for the journal of popular music studies. So I'm always trying to keep up with um, with what's going on in music, uh, popular music studies, as well as like memoirs and popular books, music criticism, et cetera. Um, the best book that I read last year, I really liked Ricky Rodriguez's A Kiss Across the Ocean, mm. um, which um, I actually had him come talk to my cultural theory grad seminar. 
Um, it's a really great book about um, Chicano fandom of British new wave and new romantic music from the eighties. Mm. Um, and in particular, what I love about that book. So it's, it's very much looking at this phenomenon as a transnational exchange. He was really invested in sort of moving away from appropriation as a way to talk about um cross-cultural engagement and so he's and he's he's bringing his own music fandom in as a queer Chicano young man growing up in Los Angeles in the 80s but what he's what he's sort of trying to map out is this exchange um, between Latin culture and British culture at, at that time and so he's pointing out how bands like the Pet Shop Boys are engaging with Miami-based freestyle in their music in the 80s, or how Susie Sue from Susie and the Banshees had this very long, meaningful fan or friendship um, with, with a variety of Chicano punks. Um, and I especially love how he weaves in memoir in it, because it's, it's mm -hmm. primarily like a work of cultural studies, but he also pulls from his diaries from that period. He talks to friends of his from that time period. Um, and I always find it, I always love whenever uh, scholars can bring themselves into their work without being indulgent about it. So I really loved that book. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. The one other question I have is, mm -hmm. um, what are you watching right now? Or what is a good TV show or series that we need to see? Mm -hmm. And can you tie in your your cooking uh, <laughs> alongside with that? and Briefly tell us about that because it's very cool. Sure. Um, I, well, I'll, I, I'll say it's an older show, or it's it's off. It's been off the air since last year. But um, one of my favorite shows of the past, um, you know, the past decade is Better Things, which was on FX um, from 2016 to last year, um, and it's a sort of slice of life show um, uh, created by Pamela Adlon, who starred in it wrote for it, directed all the episodes since uh, season two. <clears throat> and it's this story about like this single working mother who's also like this journeyman, journeywoman, character actress, has been working in, in Hollywood since she was a teenager. Um, and I'm, I'm working on a piece, a, 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 a work of scholarship that I've taken my time on. Uh, but a, a substantial component of that show from its second season on is that this character, Sam, which is a version of Pamela Adlin, cooks all the time. Mm -hmm. um, cooks for friends, cooks for her children, cooks for herself. And the show, I mean, this is a half hour sitcom, but there will be like extended passages, you know, like five minutes, an act of, of, of an episode of television, you know, maybe like the whole episode itself is focused on her cooking, which becomes an extension of her creative life as an actor. Um, and it also becomes sort of a metaphor for Adlin's creative authority over that show. Cause you see Adlin as Sam making risotto, mm -hmm. making rack of lamb. And what I love about it is it's, it's stuff that another show would just completely cut out cause it doesn't seem to be narratively motivated at all, but you learn so much about her and her relationship to her friends and family and colleagues from how she cooks. Um, and I also love that there's not, I love cooking shows in general, like kind of the stand and stir, like chopped, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but what I love about this show is there's not really, there's not like sort of an establishing shot of like this delicious meal that she made. You only sort of see her process. You don't see like the finished results, mm -hmm. which then means it's easier, at least for me as a, a viewer to kind of put myself in it as a home cook and be like, try that out. I've never made rack of lamb. Let me see. If I can <laughs> shop. Um, so I love that show. Um, I'm trying to think of like more contemporary stuff. Um, I watched Fleischman is in trouble over the break. Mm. Um, I liked that show, particularly since I'm like the age of those characters. Yeah. And it's sort of wild to see like millennial hipster nostalgia uh, <laughs> kind of become a middle aged concern. Uh, <laughs> But also just like really, I mean, I, I don't necessarily relate to the environment. Like these are very like rich people problems that they're having. But I think there is something kind of um, beautiful about how that show depicts midlife crisis mm -hmm. um, that I do think is is somewhat more universal um, across race and class than the kind of rarefied milieu that the show exists within. Mm -hmm. 
Alex, it has been um, so much fun talking to you today, hearing about all that you have going on. I feel like we've got a couple of more episodes in our near future. Happy to chat. (laughs) But um, just wanted to thank you for sharing your time with us and sharing with our listeners more about who you are and what you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Alex.